Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming out on this very rainy, um, damp evening and joining us for this uh, flashpoint in the city. My name is Jacinto O'Hagan. I'm the director of the Graduate Centre for Governance and International Affairs at the University of Queensland. Um, the flash for those of you who haven't been along to a flashpoint series before, the flashpoint is a series of panel events that we host. Um, on a kind of a regular but spontaneous basis where we draw together sort of experts, mainly from UQ, to talk about key political issues that are happening um, here and now and are on our political agenda. And today we want to discuss the incredibly important and disturbing issue of the Rohingya um, crisis, the Rohingya refugee crisis, and its implications for the politics of international law. So since, since August of this year, an estimated 500,000 Rohingya people, members of the Rohingya community um, from Myanmar, have fled Bangladesh. So it's half a million people in the course of the last few months. They add to, altogether, there's something like one million Rohingya people who have fled overseas since the 1970s, um, and a further more than 100,000 Rohingya people displaced within Myanmar itself. The UNHCR has recently released a statement that described the Rohingya crisis as the world's fastest growing refugee crisis and a major humanitarian emergency. And it called upon the international community for a renewed effort to support people fleeing from discrimination, violence and persecution. And it's understanding the nature of this violence discrimination and persecution is what I think we're going to be talking about in depth today. Amnesty International yesterday re released a report that described the Myanmar, or accused the Myanmar military of committing crimes against humanity. And the UN Human, uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, Zaid Zarad al Hussein, recently described the Rohingya crisis as a textbook case of ethnic cleansing. And elsewhere, this issue has been de described as genocide. So the words of international law, international criminal law, are incredibly important in framing this crisis as part of violations of international criminal law. And this is what we want to unpack today. We want to unpack the crisis from the perspective of international law. What is the nature of the crisis and in what context, what senses are we seeing breaches of international law? What are the implications of framing a crisis such as this in terms of ethnic cleansing or genocide? And what has the response been by the regional and international community? Um, and what tools does international law, international criminal law, offer to prevent the worsening of this crisis or to hold perpetrators accountable? And then what are the implications of the crisis for human rights, democracy and the rule of law in the region? So to discuss these issues, I'm joined by a terrific panel of my colleagues here. On my left, we have first Dr. Melanie O'Brien, and Mel is a postdoctoral research fellow at the T.C. Byrne School of Law at the University of Queensland. She's a researcher also for the Asia Pacific Centre for the Responsibility to Protect. Her research looks closely at human rights violations as, uh, and examines these violations as a way of mapping the prevention of future genocide. So looking at that correlation between human rights violations and future genocides. She's published in a range of academic journals and has sat on a number of editorial boards, including those of Human Rights Review and the, genocide, uh, the Journal of Genocide Studies and Prevention. She's won a number of prestigious international grants and she's the Vice President of the International Association of Genocide Scholars and recently was one of the conveners of the International Association of Genocide Conference at University of Queensland. Her portfolio is interesting because in addition to being an academic, she's held appointments as in the legal advisory section of the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court and uh, the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations, the Raoul Wallenberg Institute and the Australian Law Reform Commission for just a few of her appointments. Next to me, I have my good colleague, uh, Melissa Curley, and uh, Melissa is a senior lecturer in international relations in the School of Political Science and International Studies at UQ. Um, she is a, uh, she's also the uh, co-facilitator of the UQ Working Group on Human Trafficking and um, Migrant Smuggling. Her research interests are very closely on Southeast Asian politics and international relations and non-traditional security issues in East Asia, and that includes trafficking 
uh, migrant smuggling, pandemic disease, and child protection issues. She's also a specialist in Cambodian politics. Um, again, she's published widely in a range of international um, journals, and her most recent book is Migration and Security in Asia. And then last but not least, we have Professor Alex Bellamy. And Alex is the director of the Asia-Pacific Centre for the Responsibility to Protect and a professor of peace and conflict studies in the um, University of Queensland. He's a non-resident senior advisor at the International Peace Institute in New York and a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences of Australia. He co-chaired in 2008-2009 the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia-Pacific uh, Study Group on the Responsibility to Protect, and he's currently the secretary to the high-level advisory panel on the responsibility to protect in Southeast Asia. He also publishes widely and is the editor of the Global Responsibility to Protect journal. So you can see we are extremely well provided for here to discuss the issues. Um, what I'm going to do is ask our panellists um, a few questions to get them going to talk about the topics hopefully get a conversation going between them and we'll, we'll have a panel discussion for about 35, 40 minutes and we'll then go to Q&A um, from the audience. So let me start first with you, Mel, Mel One. Um, can you provide us with some background, please, on uh, what is actually happening in Myanmar and Rakhine State? Who are the Rohingyas and what's the crisis? Well, this is actually a question that I've had a lot of people approach me in the past month. They're sort of saying, Mel, what's going on? You know, what is the Rohingya crisis? And the first thing that I've said is, this is actually not new. This is nothing new and it's actually been going on for decades. It's just that it has escalated now and it's really hit the front page. So what we see is we have the Rohingya group who are a minority group, a minority Muslim group that live in Rakhine State in northern uh, Myanmar or Burma. And they, since 1982, have been considered non-citizens of Myanmar. So this, there was a citizenship law passed in 1982 and it declared that only certain minority groups were citizens and the Rohingya were specifically excluded from that, despite the fact that they had a substantial population of at least 2 million. Now the Rohingya have actually been living in that area since at least the 7th century AD. So they, they haven't just arrived there, it is an area that they've been living in for a long time. However, the Myanmar government, particularly the military leadership, says that they, well, what they do is they call them Bengalis, which to them is a derogatory term, and they refer to them as immigrants who don't actually, they're not Burmese and they don't actually belong there, despite the long history of the Rohingya people in that region. So what we've seen for several decades, basically since the 1970s, but particularly the early 1980s, is a systematic persecution and human rights violations of the Rohingya people. Now, these have escalated in once we hit the 21st century in different bursts over time, but the crimes that have been committed and that you may have read some of them in the news recently are not new and they are crimes that have been committed against the Rohingya for quite some time. They just have had points of escalation over time that we've seen. So to give you an idea of some of the human rights violations and crimes that are going on, we are seeing a restriction of movement of the Rohingya people. So a lot of them are actually being kept in camps and they're not allowed to leave the camps. They're not allowed to travel around Burma without authorization, which is basically impossible to get. They've had their documentation removed from them because they're not considered to be citizens. So therefore they have no documentation that says who they are, where they live, where they were born, when they were born, and those kind of things. Um, they've actually had their reproductive rights restricted. So a law was passed restricting um, the number of children that can be had by certain groups. And while it doesn't mention Rohingya, it's meant to apply to Rohingya by the structuring of the law that they passed there. So it means that they're only allowed to have two children in each family, and that only applies to them. Um, one of the things that that's created problems is, of course, that any of children subsequent to the two that they've had are illegal and cannot be registered and have no, basically can have no life in Myanmar. However, in reality, most of the Rohingya can't really have much of a life anyway because they are denied citizenship. They're also denied education. 
they are denied the right to participate in public life, which means they can't be public servants, they can't run for election, um, all the, you know, the kind of civil and political rights that we take for granted in a democracy. <coughs> this is despite the, you know, the recent democratic, so-called democratic elections that um, they actually had. In addition to that, we talk, we think about escalating. One of the things that has been happening for a long time is the burning of crops and the stealing or killing of animals of the Rohingya people. The restriction of movement combined with those means that they have had very limited access to food. That has escalated in recent times and there have been findings of severe malnutrition, particularly child malnutrition amongst the Rohingya people because of the lack of access to food. They are driving them out of their villages by burning their villages. They're doing this by mass shooting um, of people into the villages and they are then using RPG launchers or throwing bombs or they're even dropping bombs from helicopters to burn their villages. If you have a look, um, I had wanted to show it today but we weren't able to. There's been some satellite imagery in the last two days come out that very much shows that it's only the Rohingya villages that are being targeted. So you can see in the picture, literally one field along, there's um, a, a Rakhine village, rather, and, and it's completely untouched, and the entire Rohingya village is burnt. So they are very systematically attacking them. And when they do that, they don't actually care whether there's any Rohingya in the buildings. So they're burning, you know, they're trying to burn them alive as well. They are executing them, pulling them out and executing them, but they are also just openly shooting and killing and injuring people. Mass rape is also taking place, including gang rape. Um, the majority of women who've been to see healthcare providers as refugees have experienced sexual violence or at a minimum know many other people who have experienced sexual violence. Um, so I think, I mean, you know, I could probably talk for the entire 40 minutes about um, all of the different crimes that are being committed, but I think that gives you a pretty good overview of the types of things that are going on and how their lives are restricted and the horrific crimes that are taking place. So, Mel, there's been quite a lot of debate about how we should define the nature of the crimes that are being committed, different actors taking different perspectives on this. So, you know, in different terms, such as genocide, crimes against humanity, how are they being defined and why the, do the different definitions matter? So the three terms that are being thrown around at the moment are ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity and genocide. And the difference between them, just to explain first, ethnic cleansing isn't actually a crime defined anywhere. What we generally say it is, is the attempt to remove a group from an area. Um, that may not necessarily be by killing, but it may be to you know, physically displace them from a particular area. Obviously, we can see that that is going on, but of course, one of the problems with ethnic cleansing, as I said, it's not actually a crime defined anywhere in international criminal law. So you could never actually prosecute anyone specifically for ethnic cleansing. The second category are crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity are extremely serious. <laughs> There's a bit of a... There tends to be a bit of a competition between crimes against humanity and genocide as a category, but I really am against that because crimes against humanity are extraordinarily serious crimes. And they're crimes that are committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack against a civilian population. And that is clearly happening at the moment to the Rohingya. Um, there are different types of crimes that we can see happening, uh, crimes against humanity, such as persecution, sexual violence, murder, torture, um, executions, um, and so forth. So the third category is genocide. Now, genocide is the destruction in whole or in part of a group. That group can only be religious, racial, ethnic, or national. And that definition was limited for specific reasons, uh, political reasons, back when the Genocide Convention was negotiated in the 1940s. The Rohingya have been targeted, it was initially sort of said they were targeted for ethnic reasons, they were different ethnicity, but religion is also a huge part of it. So we can see that they are specifically targeted because of their ethnicity, but also because of their religion, because they are Muslim, and, and Burma is not a Muslim country, it's a Buddhist country. And as actually in the crimes that I'm talking about being committed, they are not just being committed by the military and by the government force, but they are being committed by local people, but also including by Buddhists. 
by Buddhist monks who are joining in on the violence. So there is a specific religious element to it. People, the, the main part of the debate is about this genocide issue. Is it genocide or is it not? I personally believe that it is. The reason that people would argue that it is not is because in law there has been a very strict view that destruction means physical destruction. So if there's no physical destruction of a group, then it can't be genocide. There is a, there's quite a movement over the past few years to move beyond that. And in talking about how you interpret law, there is room to say, well, it doesn't actually say physical destruction in the definition. It says destruction. And if you think about that a group is defined by who it is, it's very characteristics of being a religious group, of being an ethnic group. If you destroy those characteristics, you've destroyed that group. If they don't exist as that group anymore, they're gone. And one of the things that we see is that the Rohingya is dispersed in many, many, many countries. Jacinta has talked about some of the statistics, and I forgive me, I have to look at notes for these numbers because there's just so many. Um, today's number's out from the UN, 537,000 Rohingya in Bangladesh. But we've also got Rohingya in Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, India, UAE, Thailand, and Indonesia. So they as a group have been spread everywhere. But also what we can see is in terms of the crimes that fit under genocide, they are taking place. They are killing the Rohingya. They are raping the women and girls. These are genocidal crimes that can't be denied. Not all genocide crimes are killing, so we need to remember to look at the bigger picture. And if we look at the history of persecution that I've talked about, this restriction on movement, citizenship, reproductive rights, these are all things that we see happening in other types of genocides. It's the lead up to the genocide, the, the othering of the group, the discrimination and the treating them differently so that it becomes acceptable by the time they escalate genocide to actually carry out the violent killings and the violent rape. In terms of the importance of the difference, there is a genocide convention, but there is no crimes against humanity convention. So that means that often there's a push to have a mass atrocities called genocide because states should take action under the genocide convention. They don't necessarily do that when they should, but that's really the big crux when it comes to is this genocide? Because without a Crimes Against Humanity Convention, there really is nothing to force states to take action. Um, obviously, Alex is going to expand more on R2P and where that comes in more generally. But in terms of really thinking about strict international law, that's, that's the problem, problem there. <coughs> this could be a really good opportunity to bring you in, Alex, to tell us a little bit more about this broader international context and the international response. I'm wondering if you wanted to expand on that. <coughs> um, okay, so I mean, just for kind of sake of uh, sparking a, a debate, I mean, to, to pick up on that issue of whether or not it's genocide, um, from a kind of policy and, and, and practical perspective, there's an argument to say it doesn't really matter. And that in fact, right now in the heat of the moment, getting bogged down in debates about which particular one of the atrocity crimes is being committed can actually be a distraction. So we saw, for example, in the international response to the crisis in Darfur, but really for about 24 months, the world was hamstrung around this question of, is this genocide or isn't it genocide? Um, the UN had a commission of inquiry into this that came up with a, a, a report that said, it might be or it might not be, and it's for a, a competent court to decide. This is now a legal concept, and it will be courts that decide, principally on the issue of intent, because that's the issue that's, that is debated, is are these crimes being committed with the intent to destroy the group in whole or in part? So the crimes substantively are the same, whether it be a crime against humanity, or war crime, or genocide, it's the context and um, the uh, intent behind it that, that's different. So from a policy point of view, one of the things that I've kind of learned from, as I've lost hair over the years, is that in the heat of the crisis, you probably don't want to get too bogged down in, in this question because diplomats will bog you down in this question and it will um, divert attention from the more practical questions of what physically is actually going on, ascertaining the, the facts of the case and thinking through um, what can be done about it. And there's no doubt 
but atrocity crimes are being committed. So, uh, as, as both Jacinta and Mel have pointed out, there is a wide body of evidence now about systematic ethnic cleansing, about crimes against humanity. So these, these are indisputable points. There are points of dispute about the extent and the scale and when and who and, and, and wherefore. But in terms of the fact that there is a, an emergency, a crisis characterised by the widespread and systematic commission of atrocity crimes, that's not in doubt. And that's where the responsibility to protect comes in and relates to some of these legal points that Mel was, was talking about. So the background of RTP was, was very much a political background. And it was born out of a recognition from states that a huge gap had opened up between what international law said and what actually happened in the field. So international law since 1945, and, and Mel is the expert on this, so we'll be able to tell us more about this, has developed a broad suite of prohibitions and legal protections around atrocity crime. So forbidding um, armed groups from attacking civilians, demanding that positive steps be taken uh, to prevent um, civilian casualties in war, uh, ensuring things like humanitarian access in times of armed conflict and in times of civil war. So we have this huge body of law, but very little action when it came to enforcing or implementing the law. And this gap, which was there throughout the Cold War, in fact, in some ways was starker during the Cold War, but became really apparent after the Cold War. And for me, the classic, the classic um, lesson about the, that gap is in the fact those of you old enough will remember the war in former Yugoslavia, uh, which was also characterised by widespread atrocity crimes, including the crime of genocide um, in Srebrenica. But in response to that crisis, the United Nations created a peacekeeping mission that was called, had as its name, the United Nations Protection Force. Yet the UN Protection Force didn't actually have a mandate to protect anybody, apart from itself. And this was ruthlessly exposed in 95 in Srebrenica. And so this gap became apparent. So people said, well, how do we try to close this gap? And R2P is one of the ways of trying to address this gap. It's by getting states to make a political commitment that says, look, we've got these legal obligations, and actually, you know what, we might actually implement them. So RTP says three things. It says, firstly, it says states have a responsibility to protect their populations from the crimes that Mel was talking about, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and ethnic cleansing. And RTP is powerful because it's a state, a one-sentence statement, but every state is signed up to that says, we have this responsibility. No ifs, no buts, no caveats. And also, in the case of Myanmar, what's really interesting is that RTP doesn't say states have a responsibility to protect their citizens, it says states have a responsibility to protect populations. So irrespective of whether or not somebody is a citizen in that country, the responsibility to protect applies. Second thing RTP says, recognising that there are sometimes situations where a state may be well-intentioned, but physically unable to protect its population from you know, violent extremists or non-state armed groups, or both, is that the international community should assist states to fulfil their responsibility to protect good example of this in the region would be the uh, Regional Assistance Mission to the Solomon Islands. An example where you have a government facing civil war and conflict, asking for international support and receiving it. That's the, third, the second uh, pillar. The third pillar says, if the state is manifestly failing its responsibility to protect, then the international community has a responsibility to take steps to protect vulnerable populations. Firstly, using all the peaceful measures at its disposal, and then if that fails, by acting through the UN Security Council. So that's RTP. That was agreed in 2005 and has become now kind of a, a common part of the diplomatic language. Now, where we see it at play in a situation like Myanmar, you might say, well, the international response has been pretty lame. And indeed, the international response has been uh, pretty lame. But you, what you don't see is anyone in the region saying, this isn't an international concern. What Myanmar does to its population is, is no concern of ours. You don't see states saying that. 30 years ago, you would have seen states saying that. You would have seen states saying, well, you know, it's bad and all that, but you know, sovereignty is sacrosanct, this is an internal matter, nothing we can do about it. So you see an, an understanding today that the international community should be doing something about it. And a lot is happening. The reason why it's been so muted is, of course, this current crisis in Rakhine State comes in the context of a much broader reform process 
in Myanmar, including a much broader peace process in Myanmar. So states and diplomats and peacemakers in the UN have been caught in this dilemma of what to prioritise and how to prioritise and how far to push the government without pushing it so far that you undermine the broader peace process. And to put that in context, uh, Myanmar, uh, if you ranked countries the number of conflict years since 1945, Myanmar would be the number one country. It's not had a year of peace since independence. It's currently negotiating a comprehensive peace agreement with 14 non-state armed groups. Um, eight of those have signed on, six remain outside um, of the tent. Over the course of that time, of course, tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands of people have been killed um, in that armed conflict. At the same time, of course, in Myanmar, you had a long period of very authoritarian military rule. The reason why the military took over power in Myanmar was because it was the only national institution that could hold the country together at the time, back in the 50s and 60s. And then military rule became entrenched. What we have now with the, with the, with the elections and the new, um, the new government, led by Aung San Suu Kyi, is also a deep political transition taking place in Myanmar. But it's a complicated, and, um, and, um, complicated transition that will stretch over years, if not generations. And there's a sting in the tail, which was that the military said, in, in return for open elections, we demand two things. We demand 25% of all the seats in Parliament. So 25% of all the seats in Parliament are held by the military. And we demand that we retain total control over all security and defence affairs. So the military retains total control over um, defence affairs. So the reason why the international response has been tepid at best uh, fragmented and counterproductive at worst is because diplomats have been trying to weigh up firstly where the best pressure points are and again one of the kind of interesting things has been the amount of focus that's been placed on Aung San Suu Kyi and how little focus there has been on Myanmar's military leadership when constitutionally Aung San Suu Kyi has no formal control over the military and also if you read the constitution carefully it may well be that were Aung San Suu Kyi to speak out on military matters, that would be judged a violation of the constitution and grounds uh, for her removal from power. And it's worth remembering as well that Aung San Suu Kyi's um, foremost lawyer, a companion of 25 years who she had investigating how this constitution can be changed, was assassinated um, earlier, earlier this year. So there are issues um, around that. So, You've got this question of um, what, what to do. Now, as I said, lots of people have been doing things, so the UN has engaged on this matter um, in a variety of ways. So the UN has a field presence in Myanmar, but it's not one that has a human rights component. The UN for years has been trying to persuade the government of Myanmar to grant its field mission there a human rights component, um, but the government of Myanmar, for obvious reasons, has pushed back on that. Um, so the UN field mission in Myanmar is based on development and humanitarian concerns only. So that's where you've seen those reports about you know, the UN silencing talk about, about the... Because what they're worried about is that, firstly, it's, it's not, the, not their mandate, but secondly, more importantly, they're worried about the closure of humanitarian access. That if they come out and speak out on human rights concerns, particularly prior to um, the event, that the government and the military will use that as an excuse to close humanitarian access. And this is not a new problem, it's a problem that the UN faces, faced in Darfur, faced in, in Sri Lanka, faces um, lots of places. But nevertheless, you have that field mission. And I'm pleased to say that in the last two days, the UN has actually negotiated access for its agencies and the Red Cross into Rakhine State. So the, um, both the Secretary General and the uh, Head of the Department of Political Affairs, Geoffrey Feltman, have been pushing humanitarian access as a key thing, and the government has, at least in principle, open up humanitarian access. The other thing is that the UN's human rights machinery has been working on this as well. So the UN has a special rapporteur um, that reports regularly to the Human Rights Council of Australia just got elected to on the situation uh, in Myanmar broadly, but she's been focusing quite a lot in the last 12 to 18 months on the situation in Rakhine State, and in particular on rising hate speech amongst the Buddhist extremist community. And here's again where issues are interlinked. 
Why is there a rise of hate speech in the last 12 to 18 months? Well, what's been going on in the rest of the country is democratic transition. Opening up the freedom of speech has been happening in the last 12 to 18 months. And when you open up freedom of speech, it's not always only nice liberals that get to talk about things, but also extremist voices as well come to the fore. So as you've seen a political opening, you've seen not just pro-democracy voices coming to the fore, but also more extreme voices as well coming to the fore. And the UN Special Rapporteur has been talking about that quite a bit in the last 12 to 18 months, for which she herself has been um, targeted and abused pretty, pretty awfully <coughs> by Buddhist extremists. We've also seen the UN Security Council. It's not yet passed resolutions and is unlikely to do so because of obvious geopolitical reasons with Myanmar's relationship with China. But the Council has had informal consultations on the issue, has talked uh, to Kofi Annan um, on the issue and the Secretary General on the issue. And the issue is very much on the Council's agenda. And there is a sense that if the political moves uh, at play at the moment don't come to fruition, then it may well come back to um, the Council, where China would likely block coercive measures, but may be open to, to more um, or less coercive measures. And on the final point, I just I couldn't talk without mentioning Kofi Annan. So one of the things that Aung San Suu Kyi did on coming to power was recognise that the Rakhine conflict is a complex and difficult conflict. And it's important to underscore just how deeply entrenched the discrimination and antagonism towards the Rohingya is in Burmese society. If you were in Yangon right now reading all of the newspapers in Yangon, you would not be reading newspapers that say government's committing terrible crimes against the Rohingya, we need to listen to the international community. You'll be listening, you'll be reading papers that say it was Rohingya Islamist terrorists that started this by attacking police posts, government needs to be tougher, needs to take a harder line, and it's because it was a bit, went a bit soft under Aung San Suu Kyi, that's why we've got the problem we've got now. So this is a deeply, deeply entrenched discrimination, as Mel talked about. This is not new, this goes back a long, long way. So what Aung San Suu Kyi did was to say, well, we did some sort of blueprint for how we move forward. Now, anything that the government comes up with is going to be tainted right from the get-go as being politicised by one side or the other. So she asked Kofi Annan, all of you know, is former Secretary General of the UN, who did a, a, a good job with uh, conflict mediation in Kenya, as good a job as was possible to do in, in Syria. He got as close as anyone got to a negotiated settlement in Syria back in 2012. She invited Anan to lead a panel of experts to review the Rakhine conflict and present a comprehensive plan for how you move forward. And I think it's no coincidence that the attacks on the police post that triggered all of this occurred on the very day that Kofi Annan was releasing his, uh, his plan. What's interesting is that amidst all the violence, the Aung San Suu Kyi government has committed to implementing the Kofi Annan plan in full. And that includes provisions for granting citizenship to the Rohingya, which lies at the, lies at the heart of this issue. So what the UN is now saying is that the, the priorities have to be threefold. Firstly, the provision of humanitarian aid boats urgently needed, both over the border, but also inside Rakhine State to create the conditions possible for the second thing that needs to happen, which is for the populations to return in a safe and, and dignified manner. And then the third thing that needs to happen is, of course, the full implementation of the Coffee Anna plan, as, as the government has, has committed to. One final thing. <laughs> I'm to let a very UN centric story. Yeah. There's another story that goes on, and it's kind of a remarkable story of transition in the region that doesn't get into the paper because it's done quietly, which is the regional diplomacy as well. So we all know about the ASEAN way, the quiet diplomacy. And sometimes that's mistaken as ASEAN not doing anything. But actually ASEAN leaders have been doing quite a lot. If you just look at the, uh, the flight schedules of ASEAN foreign ministers in particular, you'll find that lots of them have visited Myanmar in the past month or so. They've been doing so to press the government to show restraint, to end the violence, and to accept a negotiated end. Also, you'll see, when you look at the UN negotiations on humanitarian access, how they finally got it was by partnering with ASEAN to say, let's do this as a UN-ASEAN partnership that is, of course, more acceptable 
And that's an important seismic shift in the way that ASEAN thinks of these issues yeah. um, as well. Which is a beautiful point to bring mm. Melissa in because, um, Melissa, I'm very interested in, in your take on what the regional concerns are, mm. the concerns of the regional power. And let's remember this is a region that has profound experiences mm. of genocide itself, mm. and particularly of the Cambodian genocide and the war crimes mm. uh, tribunals, uh, UN-backed ones that have taken place in the wake of that. Mm. So what do you think are the principal concerns and of um, the states in the region? How has that shaped their responses? Yeah, well, I think just to you know extend on the last point that Alex made, um, a bit of history with ASEAN, the, the, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, um, it, it's very true, I think, that we have to find uh, a balanced view uh, in the way that ASEAN tries to um, deal with these issues. Um, it was originally formed in 1967 in the height of the Cold War, ostensibly, I think, to reduce the, the intervention and impact of great powers in the region. But I think often overlooked is the fact that it was one of its primary um, reasons for being formed was also to solidify regime security and internal security. So some of the you know the history I think that Mel and, and Alex have presented really you know we have to look back at history and remember the kind of challenges of state building and nation building that that countries in Southeast Asia have faced historically and continue to face. And of course one of the ongoing, uh, I think, um, concerns in their mind, which would be in the mind of Southeast Asian states, but also perhaps in Northeast Asia, is the potential and the, the worry about this local and regional issue potentially escalating and involving other powers and, and, and escalating beyond the region in a very negative way, perhaps further you know, uh, terrorism and extremism. So, um, and as Alex mentioned, I think the you know ASEAN has a reputation of uh, developing its so-called ASEAN way uh, of and emphasising non-intervention and emphasising um, rather a sort of a backdoor diplomacy, if you like, rather than open criticism of states. And that really harks back to the early experiences, uh, I think, that of when the of when the organisation was formed. That in in those in those times, very you know, outward criticism of the political goings-on, economic development in those states was seen as highly provocative and politically destabilising. And so I think over time what we see is that this type of diplomacy emerging, the so-called backdoor diplomacy, and I think we do, you know, there's some good commentary coming out, including from one of our colleagues, uh, uh, Dr Noel Murata, about what ASEAN can do in this in, is has done, as Alex mentioned, but what it can do in the next immediate few months. And you know, he talks about things like uh, helping uh, Myanmar uh, work with the UN, and also thinking about the ways that it can help coordinate on humanitarian intervention. And you know, we're we're talking here physically as well, uh, logistically, about a very significant. If we look at the question of repatriation, we're talking about an enormous, a significant. Uh, logistical, administrative uh, policy exercise, and so um, you know, ASEAN can be involved uh, in this, in these kinds of uh, development of these kinds of um, uh, programs, and it has expertise in in, the, in countries in the region that may be able to uh, participate in those. Uh, but I think some of the concerns that regional uh, countries will have in ASEAN relate to the further escalation of violence and extremism, the potential for, the, for the, uh, these concerns um, uh, religious, uh, inter-religious violence become escalating beyond the region or, or you know, additional uh, external combatants coming into the, into the violence and, and escalating it that way. Um, and so I think you know containing the threat of of external militants is something that regional states are very con very concerned about. Um, so it seems we have this you know perennial tension here between the pursuit of 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 international law and the norms of the protection of the individual and concerns with security and sovereignty and protection, which are major issues here. I I think at this point it might be useful to throw the floor open to. Um, to see if there's questions from the floor that can come to any of our panellists to comment or develop on the issues that they've raised so far. So, any takers? 
James. Yeah. yeah. Um, like building on what Professor Bellamy said earlier with the plant or with our coffee announced plan and the acceptance of it by our San Suu government, if they did try to push that through, how would the military respond? Would they have an incentive? <coughs> so do you think they would oppose it? And if they did, how exactly would they do it through? security concerns which are under the strict domain of the military or under administrative concerns, as I know the government so the military also has significant power over, how exactly would they try to sabotage the plan, if at all? <laughs> good, good question. Um, as they always say, you should you know, never predict what may or may not happen, so I'll have a go. Um, so, undoubtedly, the hardliners in the military are not unhappy with the situation as it is now. They see that they've got a, a situation where they can deal with the Rohingya situation that they've wanted to deal with for a long time and blame their arch enemy on San Suu Kyi for everything that happens as a result and maybe even force her out of power and find some sort of excuse. So they're kind of quite, quite, quite happy with the situation. Now they kind of quite like waking up and reading the international news um, having to go out on Sun Tzu Chi and, uh, and looking at, at the news in Yangon where you know, 12 political parties have now come together to call for Aum San Tzu Chi and the NLD's resignation and demand a stronger line against um, the, the, the so-called terrorists. Now they don't like the Kofi Annan plan for lots of obvious reasons. It goes against the kind of fundamental aspects of, um, of, of what they're about. So how do, you, how do you try and persuade them to go along with the Kofi Annan plan? Well, Two things help. One is legitimacy. And this is precisely why Aung San Suu Kyi brought in Kofi Annan in the first place. It's because you know, it, 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 it's kind of the Nelson Mandela effect. You know, Nelson Mandela mediated the conflict in Burundi in the 1990s by simply arriving saying, I'm Nelson Mandela, here's your police, peace plan, as if anybody was going to argue against it, because he had such authority and legitimacy as a peacemaker. So part of the reason for getting Kofi Annan to do it in the first place was Legitimacy. So the plan has, has legitimacy and a degree of buy-in already as a result from different political parties. So this will make it difficult initially for, for the military to, to push back. The more legitimacy you can get around that plan, so the more you can make sure that people across the country know what it is, what it calls for, why it calls for it, um, the better. The second thing you need is, is good old material support. One of the things that our centre has called for recently is a donors conference around the Coffee Annan plan. So bringing together the world's major donors, major financial backers, because there are things in that plan that don't cost money. Um, obviously not so much the citizenship issue, but the other thing about Redkind State is it's the poorest part by a considerable margin of an already poor country. So in order to address the root causes of the crisis in Redkind State, you've also got to invest significantly, significantly in development. So one of the ways you do that, of course, is to use the plan as a vehicle for marshalling serious amounts of development assistance. That again, backs up the legitimacy with material good. One of the things that we've had kind of found in, in, in the past is if people's lives are materially getting better as a result of some political process, they are more likely to support that political process than they are if either nothing happens or things um, start to get worse. So what needs to happen for that third phase is political, smart politics within Myanmar, acknowledging and understanding that there's going to be pushback, not just from the military, but also from other sectors of the community, but also the international community needs to decide whether or not it's going to back it, and if it is going to back it, it needs to do so um, in serious ways. Now one of the interesting, going back, and this will be my final point, well, the other thing that Myanmar teaches us is that sanctions are a really poor way of influencing policy behaviour. So the West had sanctions on Myanmar for 20 years, when all it delivered was more authoritarian government and no, no reform. Only when sanctions were removed and things were opened up did that impetus for reform start to kick in. And once you've let that genie out of the bottle, it's hard to put it back in the bottle again. <coughs> It's an interesting point, Alex, because we're looking at the different instruments that we have in terms of negotiation and in terms of development, but there are also these tools of international criminal law itself and the, the issues of, of the deterrence factor, perhaps, of trying to hold perpetrators to account. Now, uh, this is interesting. I think it would be useful to get both 
um, Melissa and, and, and Mel, Mel Two's comments mm-hmm. on this. I mean, Melissa, we were talking before about the, uh, the experience of Cambodia and the, 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 the application there of the use of war crimes trials, mm-hmm. holding uh, mm-hmm. people to account. Does mm-hmm. that have a role, do you think? Is that an influence? Is it an instrument? You know, well, the, yeah, I mean, of course... I think we can't um, we can't completely compare the Cambodian situation to the Rohingya, the Rohingya one currently. You know, they're two distinct, um, you know, historical kind of moments. But what we I think what we can say certainly from the Cambodian experience is that uh, there's you know a, a deep I think um, connection within Cambodian society amongst uh, you know people in the government, stakeholders in civil society, individual citizens who have. Um, through the Khmer Rouge tribunals and through the um, the participation of civil civil parties, which has been, I think, quite an important facet of um, the particular makeup of the trials there, uh, it has brought it has given the institutional kind of context for how <coughs> for people to speak about their experiences, really, in a in a very um, you know obviously within the judicial environment where everything is. Um, you know, notated and, and published, and and so it ha- and therefore there's you know the other members of society also have access to it. So I think that the experience of the you know the genocide in Cambodia. I mean, I, sp- I gave a public lecture in June in Cambodia on what the strategic role that Cambodia can play in so- in Southeast Asia in promoting the the uh, responsibility to protect. And I think it's, there's an enormous richness there within not just the parts of the government, civil society, but, but people in general mm. and how they, their lived experience. It is, it's one of the, it's the only Southeast Asian country that has a genocide museum. It has, you know, very rich uh, and now, you know, documentation uh, and case, uh, case law from the Khmer Rouge tri- Tribunal, uh, just to name a few. So uh, I think, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot that we can certainly learn from the history of the Cambodian genocide. Not to say that, you know, um, I don't know that we want to sort of draw immediate conclusions. But what what I think we can say is that there are a lot of there there are, there are stakeholders and people uh, within Cambodia that are willing to become champions for mm-hmm. promoting the need for atrocity prevention measures, which you know can be very they can be at the grassroots, they can be in in, in schools. Cambodia also has quite a significant genocide education and history component. Uh, so there's a lot that I think the experience of Cambodia can bring to other countries. I mean, but having said that, I think you know one of the points that Alex made. I think we need to return to, and that is persuading and uh, convincing uh, the Myanmar government to look at the root causes of the problem of the of the issue. And so, you know, that what I'm talking about here in Cambodia is all well and good, but it, I, I think we need to bear in mind that this question of how how do we bring political will to bear on the root causes of the problem yeah. that we're currently talking about? Yeah. Mel, what do you think about that? Is it too soon to be thinking about the application of international criminal trials, for instance? Well, I'm an international criminal lawyer, so it's never too soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I obviously one of the slight, one of the major differences between what happened with Cambodia and now is that we currently have a permanent international criminal court, which didn't exist in the 1970s when the Khmer Rouge were committing their atrocities. The international criminal court, however, has limited jurisdiction, and that jurisdiction is only over the uh, crimes committed within the territory of countries that are state parties to its Rome Statute, which is the treaty that the International Criminal Court is based on, um, or crimes committed by nationals of that state. Unsurprisingly, Burma or Myanmar is not a state party to the Rome Statute. <laughs> um, that means that, you know, obviously that leaves a gap in jurisdiction, and the only thing that would remain is for the Security Council to refer the situation to the International Criminal Court, as it did with the situation in Darfur. However, as Alex has said, anything that comes through the Security Council is going to be vetoed by China. So the likelihood of the atrocities in Burma being referred to the ICC by the Security Council is basically none, unfortunately. So that leaves us with the other option of looking at 
an ad hoc tribunal. So there are currently quite a lot of those. There is the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia that Melissa was talking about, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, the International Criminal Tribunal for the four years former Yugoslavia, the Special Court for Sierra Leone. So there's, you know, there's a history of these courts and tribunals being created. However, there's a lot of politics that goes with the creation of these. So the ICTY and the ICTR are purely international, for example, and they were set up by the UN. They're actually UN entities. The ICC is not. It's its own body. Whereas the ECCC, that was a lot of work to put that together because the Cambodian government did not want an international tribunal. So what they settled on, and if you notice the name, Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, it's actually a special chamber that they made within the Cambodian court system. And it's a hybrid court where they have half international and half Cambodian staff. And as part of that, it has been plagued with a lot of issues through corruption and government influence on the Cambodian staff. That aside, though, talking about the creation of an ad hoc tribunal is a lot of work and can be very difficult. And whether or not they would want to do that is another is a you know just a whole other issue. And the ability to be able to do it. Um, other options that people have are people's tribunals, which there has already been one recently. I think about Myanmar, but people's tribunals just have. You know, it's basically a chance for victims to tell their story, but they have no weight. You know, there's no actual accountability for it. Um, I know I'm an international criminal lawyer, so I'm a big believer in criminal accountability, but it's not necessarily always the only solution that should be on offer under the transitional justice umbrella when we're talking about coming out of atrocities. Um, so in the end, it may be that there may be another option that suits the Burmese society and community better, such as a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, for example, um, that works better. But I do find that generally, in the case of atrocities, victims do want some kind of way to have what happened to them recognised, acknowledged and believed. And that's really one of the most important things that comes out of these. But whatever means of accountability we, you know, we find coming from that in a particular society. Mm. Okay, I'll take just one more question, I think, um, before we wrap. Well, maybe take two questions and take them together if you could make them concise. Thank you. This gentleman here first, yeah. Thank you for uh, the outstanding discussion. Uh, now, people are talking about the legal issues, about uh, genocide and uh, the related matters. After some days, Later, the matter will dismay. And uh, you know, Bangladesh is the main, uh, in addition to India, Bangladesh is the main, uh, well, is another victim of this situation. Mm, yeah. So, uh, Bangladesh is remaining uh, behind the screen. So, uh, now many people are telling that Hokkien and Hong Kong uh, report will be materialized. If ultimately, this, uh, any, uh, uh, any initiative uh, doesn't take place, Thanks. Can I just briefly take this other question um, here, and then maybe we'll just give final words to the panel in, in addressing those two questions. Thank you for that question. Sure. So uh, I was just wondering, hey, uh, how, what can the international community learn from this uh, in terms of how we do things in future? I was making the point that the freedom of expression that was given then had this, this 
this terrible effect. And I was wondering, um, A, was this predictable? Did somebody say, hey, if we do all of this, do you know what will happen? This, this, is a, this is a real possibility. Um, and B, to the extent that the international community can um, modulate how reforms are going, did we do something wrong? Did we, did we get the order wrong? If, if we've got human rights and civil rights, if we've got democracy and if we've got development, is there a different order we should have tried to push this in? Was, was putting, you know, we have seen cases before where putting democracy on the table has, has not helped mm. um, matters in terms, of, in terms of giving people a reason to, to commit crimes they might not otherwise would have. Um, so is there some, was it predictable and is yep. there some takeaway? Should we come across the seat? Do you perceive that, that any kind of international science is going on behind the scenes? International science? Is that any kind of science by the international players behind the scenes? Also, science, science, science behind the scenes. Because in Australia, the response is also there, right? Like yep. I've been reading this situation for a number of times, being a student of human services and things a lot. If you like, also, I still want you to mind for a long time. So Thank how do you have a very massive response from the countries like Australia, from the countries like Japan, from the countries like India, Thank, thank you. We, we, we'll, we'll move to just uh, the panels responding to those few questions, I think. And just just a, for my, mostly it was a political question, but just a, your question about you know, how a state doing this. What's interesting is that Raphael Lemkin, who was a Polish jurist who created the word genocide, when he was studying law, he... So this was, he, you know, he'd seen what happened in the Armenian genocide and he was also a Holocaust survivor. And he actually went to his lecturers, his professors, and he said, okay, I understand about sovereignty. Like, sovereignty is really important. All nations have control over their territory. He said, but surely that doesn't give them the right to just go and murder their own citizens. And that's exactly what he was saying. And that is, over his career, he created the word genocide to to cover that because he felt that there had to be something bigger than sovereignty that stopped states from doing that kind of thing, that it just wasn't enough. Um, and a, a little quick thought on Hugh's question is that one interesting thing is in the past week, Burma, Myanmar has actually ratified the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which is set to be active in their country early next year. And I just found this the height of irony because they are in, uh, if you don't know the, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, some of the things that it covers, as you can imagine from the title, are things like the right to housing, the right to healthcare, and the right to culture and education. They are all things that are currently being violated for the Rohingya, you know, they're Villages are being destroyed. They don't have access to education. Um, they have extraordinarily limited access to health care. So, uh, you know, I find it quite ironic that they are ratifying these instruments while at the same time absolutely violating pretty much every right that's underneath them. Yeah, just very briefly, I'll just uh, re remark on the ASEAN context, I think in response to your question partly. Um, I think a lot of there will be a lot of attention on ASEAN to show a greater deal of unity in its in its response, even if it's rhetorical unity, initially. And uh, I think for the former Indonesian Foreign Minister Martin Natalagawa just this week talked about you know sort of a passive uh, that ASEAN had failed to be more unified in its response. But I think he also made a very good point, and that is that. Um, the international community doesn't expect ASEAN to have a complete, have a magic wand to solve the problems, but it, 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 what it hopes that it will have a script and help build a roadmap to be part of the solution. And I, I, I hope that that will be the case. And uh, yeah. Alex, last very, word. <laughs> very quickly, so um, just there's a kind of common theme in, in two of the questions there. One, one thing I would say in relation to RTP is. If we need more research and activism around precisely what different governments are doing in order to fulfil their responsibilities to protect everyone has signed up to this. This is not a thing that only the West has or that only neighbouring states have. So it's a legitimate question to say, what has Australia done 
fulfill its commitments? What has India done to fulfill its commitment in this case? What is Bangladesh doing? And from that, to generate both political activism, but also policy ideas. And what could Australia do? Well, one thing, we've just got onto the Human Rights Council. The most likely route to accountability is through the current government-led investigation that will be monitored by the UN Human Rights Council Special Rapporteur. If that government-led investigation is inadequate, the Special Rapporteur will report to the Human Rights Council on which Australia sits. One of the things that the Human Rights Council can do is refer matters to the General Assembly or the Security Council. A difficult and long-winded route, but not impossible, as we saw with the, the Michael Kirby Commission in North Korea. Who would have thought that North Korea would get onto the Security Council? Well, it did, thanks to Michael Kirby and the Human Rights Council. This one, on lessons learned, um, yes, it was predicted, and yes, it, uh, you know, this, people saw this coming, including people in the field. What it, what it teaches us um, is, is firstly the need for upstream action. It is much, this is going to sound counterintuitive, it is much easier to galvanise political support for a response than it is to galvanise political support for upstream action. Even though in theory the upstream stuff should be more politically consensual, but it's really, really difficult and we need to work on that. The second, the second lesson, Myanmar, you know, there's a kind of old saying, it's a good setting for it, that hard cases make bad law. You know, Myanmar and Syria, are, they are seriously difficult cases. And when you look at the policy, it's not as if, when we talk about the silence of ASEAN or, or the US, it's not as if there are a bunch of good ideas that people said, hey, you know, here's what will solve the problem, if only you could do this. If you look at the sorts of things that are being debated and knocked down, it's kind of resolutions of condemnation. So one of the things that we needed to do as researchers is actually shift our focus away from the, and no, I shouldn't say this in front of lawyers and things, away from the normative stuff and think about the practical stuff. We need more country specialists, people who know Myanmar inside out. We need to know more about what preventive tools actually work in different sorts of scenarios. What are the levers of influence? Who could be pulling those levers of influence? And how do we try to, as Melissa talked about, how do we try to build a script that is meaningful and influential in a particular uh, country. We've spent the last sort of 10 or 15 years building this kind of normative consensus, and I, I well, we're a terrible optimist, but I think we have it now, we have sufficient consensus. What we need to do now is shift gear and think exactly about those really difficult practical questions, because if we thought the normative stuff was difficult, the practical stuff is infinitely, infinitely more complex and difficult. Thank you, Alex. On that compromised, optimistic <laughs> note, I'm going to draw the proceedings to a conclusion. Um, I'd like to thank our panellists here, Mel O'Brien, Melissa Curley and Alex Bellamy for their fantastic presentations. I would also like to sincerely thank the Federal Court of Australia for their hospitality in hosting us in this beautiful venue here tonight. And um, to thank you for